Hello friends, welcome to the Mosaic Life Podcast. My name is Trey Kaufman. The Mosaic Life Podcast is a podcast on happiness, which aims to explore why so many of us chase it, and yet we never seem to find it. If you find a value in this particular conversation, which I truly think and hope you will, you can support the podcast in any number of ways, the first and probably easiest of which is pressing the subscribe button in your podcast player of choice, and you can also leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts if that is the platform that you use. That helps me continue growing, and that helps others just like yourselves find the content and the conversations had here. There are times in our everyday lives that seem all too rare when we have the opportunity to connect with someone on a truly deep and personal level. And in saying that, I want to be very clear that all connections stand on their own. They don't minimize any that had come before it. I don't want to be accused of picking a favorite child, but I do want to lead into this conversation saying the first time Bill and I chatted, we stretched a pre-interview that's designed to be 20 minutes at max into almost an hour-long conversation, which probably could have been released as its own recording. Sometimes we're just lucky to meet someone who helps us understand life in a new way. And that's what this conversation was for me. When Bill and I first connected, Bill introduced me to the idea that we live our lives in seven year cycles, which was a very interesting concept that we briefly touch on in the conversation you're about to hear. Honestly, it's probably a concept I, I would have glossed over or written off had Bill not taken pains to walk me through it. And he did send me some additional resources on it, which I'll put in the show notes. Bill helped me think about my personal cycles. Like at 21, when we, or I'll say I, found my ultimate freedom with drinking, partying, all of that. Or 28, when I started wanting more from work and relationships. Or now at 35, when my life is on such a radically different trajectory than it was seven years ago, that it's impossible to deny the plausibility of this concept. Bill is really good at helping you think differently about yourself in the best way possible. Bill O'Haran, licensed clinical social worker, is a corporate executive, practicing therapist on the weekends and evenings, and writer who seeks to use his 33 years of financial sales management experience, 24 years of marriage, 15 years of counseling clients and 8,500 hours of sitting quietly to help his clients better understand themselves and deepen their relationships. Bill teaches that all our relationships with others, especially our marriage, starts in fourth grade when our limbic emotional body learned, absorbed, and inherited our parents' lives and experiences. His research shows that relationships fail for one single reason, a lack of understanding of one's own emotions and reaction patterns created in childhood. His work with archetypes demonstrates also that relationships are not a single experience or a dyad between two people, but are eight unique relationships all occurring at the same time. Three key concepts he uses to accelerate clients' work are stand in the fire, Second Law of Thermodynamics at Home, and Relatus. These three provide direct access to understanding self. I can't overstate this. This conversation moved mountains for me, and I hope it does for you as well. Please welcome my new friend, Bill O'Haran. Anyway, how you doing? I'm good. How are you, man? It's I. Yeah, I've been so bad. looking forward to this conversation. Our initial conversation you know. was so deep and in depth. That <laughs> I don't even know where we're gonna go here, and I'm just excited to talk. <laughs> Let me tell you. Yeah, I'm the same. And you know, it's funny. I've just celebrated on St. Patty's Day 25 years of meditation, That's and I amazing. realized, oh my God, I've been sitting quietly for a generation. And a part of me is like, boy, I've traveled far. Another part of me is like. I don't know shit. I don't like, I don't know anything more than that 32 year old set myself. Yeah. I was 31 and a half. And I'm like, have I really learned more bill? Or is this just this grand illusion? You've been, 
even selling yourself anyway. <laughs> well, no, I'll tell you what. First of all, congratulations, because that's fucking incredible. I can barely get mm-hmm. myself to sit down once a week. But <laughs> when when you talk about meditating for 25 years and you talk about thinking back on all that you've learned and realizing that you don't know what you don't know. Oh, I think that's yeah. so incredibly important because I think, what is it, the Dunning-Kruger effect where people think that they know so much and they yep. just, they won't Amazing. admit to themselves what they don't know. That That's phenomenal to have that self-awareness. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Is uh, some, sometimes some long moments going, wow, what have I actually figured out? But uh, no, I appreciate that. Yeah, well, Our rational mind is such a powerful force in us and it just wants to, take the reins, take the steering wheel yeah. and our emotional body is just like, please let me share some of this stuff with you. And our rational mind's like, no, 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 no. Yeah. You know, well, how, but how okay. you been, how's your, how's your inner world? How's the inner tray? How's your life? How's, how Th- things gelling? Things are good, man. I, um, yeah. it's, I, I know you're, you're in Austin, right? The beautiful Austin, Texas. I'm in Atlanta right now because I've worked for his family office based in Atlanta, but yeah, I'm in Austin. Yeah. It's okay. Well, I just, I, I seem to keep, I, I seem to be talking with more and more people in Austin. I feel, and I, I, I don't know if people there would, you know, would, uh, uh, castrate me or whatever or not. <laughs> if I say it's the next Silicon Valley, because I think people are trying to escape from Silicon Valley, they but are. it really seems to be they like are. the next big yeah. hub. So we got to get you and Joe Rogan together. That's oh. the bottom line. <laughs> you know, that's like the holy grail these days, oh, right? God. He's a Jersey boy. I think he's from Newark, New Jersey or yeah. something crazy. I, if, if you can make that happen, Bill, I would, I would be forever yeah. indebted to you. Then. <laughs> no, things it's are good so here, man. This, um, yeah, this good. is going to be episode 91. So coming up on a hundred, wow. which is freaking incredible. Wow. Yeah. When did you start again? Two years uh, ago? Uh, yeah. Like a uh, fall of 2019, I think for a little oh, bit when I had a partner, we were doing like multiple a week. Now it's just, just one yep. a week. Yeah. Yeah. Good for you. Yeah. It's fun, man. I mean, conversations are powerful. The stuff that comes out that you never think are going to come out. Yeah. Um, it's that communication kind of muscle set. It's yeah. it's powerful. So I'm always looking forward to this. Absolutely, me too. And it, it to, to 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 that point, I you know I'll 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 be you know vulnerable with you. I. Every time leading up to these conversations, because I, I don't, I refuse to write questions. I don't want to be, you know, a question and answer show. I get nervous as hell. Like, what yep. are we going to talk Ditto. about? What is going to Ditto. happen here? Yeah. So, no, but um, I, 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 I knew the first conversation we had, we just, we just connected on, on many levels, which I really, really appreciate. And I'm, I'm looking forward to, to just jumping into this with you. And, you know, if we talk about mind and, uh, well, one thing you mentioned, one one key word that stuck out to me is is our monkey minds because mm-hmm. I, I I've speaking of Joe Rogan, I hear him talk about it all the time, and it's not something it's not a conversation piece I've been able to have on this on this particular mm-hmm. podcast. So I, I love to just start there, yep. and 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 Perfect. especially when in regard to meditation, because that is for me one of the biggest struggles is it's not necessarily shutting our minds down and sitting in silence, it's being able to you know be with your thoughts and, and know that you can Bingo. filter through them. Bingo. You nailed it. You just summarized it. We don't have to say any more. Okay, that is perfect. The All right, well, summary of life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I mean, how 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 do you deal with? Are that? we in? Are we started? Well, are we we're good? we're good. Yeah, we're we're rolling. Perfect. Perfect. So that question of of the monkey brain, which I believe it's Buddha. I think the Hindus use that term as well. Here's the science behind it, which which you know we did. A, we've done a ton of work over the last ten or fifteen years looking at why we behave the way we do, why, why do we respond, why do we feel, why do we act. Our, rectic, our rational self, our neocortex, is the youngest part of our brain. Yeah. It's only about 2 million years old, right? So, And it sits at the very front of the skull. And what's behind the skull? You have the, which I'm going to explain in a second, you have the reticular activating, sec- reticular activating system, you have the midbrain, and then you have the um, reptilian brain. Right. So the way the brain's designed is that every second right now, Trey, in you, there are emotions seeping up your belly, seeping up from your heart. Your heart's got 40,000 brain neurons. Your, your belly's got um, the neurons that are exactly like the brain as well. They're both thinking, and they're sending information up through the reptilian brain into the center of your skull. They're sending it to the reticular activating system. On the other side of the reticular activating system, if you, look, if you think about it as a traffic cop, as a, at a traffic intersection, are these thoughts about 50 to 60,000 a day, right? Thought, pen, right. got to go, I'm late, blah, blah, blah. Uh, spreadsheet, who do I call? These are thoughts, perfect, beautiful. They're all an illusion, but those thoughts are, tr- are 
the, our, our emotions, which are coming up, like I said, through the reptilian, through, uh, up into the middle of the skull, they're trying to get to the front of our brain by design. Right. The neocortex is designed biomagnetically. The structure of the human is to keep, to avoid those. Our brain wants to solve, wants to rationalize, wants to fix our youngest brain, our, our oldest brain, which is connected to eternity. I know that sounds all new agey, but our reptilian brain is what? A couple hundred million years old? Right. So you've got this intersection. Here's the powerful thing is that our rational mind does not want to know about when we were dropped like a hot rock, when we in eighth grade, we didn't, doesn't want to, doesn't want to feel into, you know, dad ignoring us, mom ignoring us, all those emotions, right? I just got goosebumps saying that. Yeah. It doesn't really want to go there. Um, and so what happens is the reticular activating system, this, this traffic cop is the center of what in a human being? It's the center of their motivation. All motivation emanates, biomagnetically emanates from the reticular activating system. So because you have this discourse, you have this friction, you have this re repelling, the left brain literally repelling right brain impulses, you get this, this conflagration. You get this, you know, people that don't want to sit, you know, they're really confused. And it's, it's all natural. The point is our left brain has to be taught and introduced to our right brain. That's the pure summary of meditation. It's the summary of all the ancient ceremonies that all the ancient cultures have been doing for 250,000 years on the planet Earth. We're all to get the adult out of their rational self and enter the world of the child, the heart. Even the Bible says only children go to heaven. They don't mean actual young people. They mean the child heart opened, right. which, is the, which is the emotions coming up, meeting the rational and the rational, helping the emotional and helping each other understand each other. It's two different languages. Yeah. When... When, I mean, as, as you mentioned, this is something that we've been doing for hundreds of thousands of years, trying yeah. to introduce the left to the right, I, I think you said. So when when did we lose that? I mean, and now I, I, it's... <laughs> I, it, we just, wow. We, we, I, I don't know even know how to word it any more subtly than that. When did we lose that that innate desire to have the two communicate and actually it's, be mindful? It's bizarre that you asked that question. I was just reading an article written by Tom Barry, I believe. And he talks about, and this sounds crazy. I'm just, I'm just throwing this against the whiteboard. During the plagues, 1347, 1350s, and then the plague that, that, that ravaged uh, England, which is into the 1650s. So yeah. that time frame, about a two or 300 year time frame, was a time where the Renaissance and the rational thinking became more, uh, human beings were more compelled or impelled to think more rationally because there had been such unrest, there's been such loss, there's been all this faith in like spirituality and nature and the creation myths and all these ancient beliefs that a lot of the bigger thinkers and those with kind of power, whether it's the church or, right. or um, governing bodies, they kind of lost faith in Mother Nature. And this is where the kind of the divine feminine really got a hit, right? The earth, the universe is, is driven by Shakti, it's driven by the divine, whether, right. we, whether men want to know it or not. You know, we're not here because of men, we're here because of the feminine, the creativity we come out of our, 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 our mom. The point is, is that he was saying that during that time, 1300s, 1400s, 1500s, there was this big shift in mentality because let's figure out who we are, what we're doing. Let's solve the problems. Let's use science getting to the 1800s and the 1900s and into 2000s. Let's solve it because the earth created such uh, cataclysmic you know, uh, problems for human beings. They decided, let's go left brain. And right. now we're shifting back, Trey. I mean, this sounds all new agey and everybody can shut it off here, but we've left the Piscean age yeah. and now we've entered the Aquarian age. And this is, this is, this is ancient calendars. This isn't Bill kind of spewing new agey stuff. The minds have been talking about every culture has these, has these um, 24,000 year cycles, two times 12, 12 houses of the Zodiac in the sky. Yeah. And every 2000 years, it shifts to a new, a new, uh, a new place. So anyway, I think that was an interesting piece that I read. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and as, as you talk, 
as you, as you talk about new agey and uh, I, I have, I have a feeling that part of this conversation will pro- probably in people's minds border on a woo, which I, I it's not going to, because I, <laughs> I, 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 I know that you have the scientific background to, to back a lot of it up, but this also harkens back to the conversation we had initially. And we started talking about, we started talking about sleep paralysis. We started talking about astral projection. We started talking about things yep. that I actually have experience with, which is to me is something that I probably in some degree try to shut out of my mind because it doesn't make rational sense to me. Yes. But then we also yes. talked about living in, I think, seven year periods of our lives and how yep. I'm 35 and things have started picking oh, up wow. for me. So I really yeah. want to dig into a lot of this because I do my best to be as pragmatic as I can on, on yeah. this show. And so if I'm able to speak with somebody who can help <laughs> connect the two areas for me, that that's that that means a lot. I love it. I love it. So, I mean, you're really asking, the, you know, kind of the, the greatest question is how do we get out of, how do we integrate these two sides of right. ourselves? Right. So the universe, the, so the great, great researcher, um, Robert Monroe, who was a big time executive in Manhattan in the fifties was having these crazy experiences where he kept passing out and they, the, all the scientists, all the doctors couldn't figure out what was going on. And so he had these, he's got a, the Monroe Institute. It's in Virginia. It's been around for, I think, 45 years. And he studied out-of-body experiences because he was having all these out-of-body experiences. And he says, to all this information that he's gathered, his daughter's running the Institute right now, he said, the reason we come back, Trey, whether we believe it or not, there's something that animates us. There's something yeah. that, that fills this physical, whether you call it Atman or soul, whatever you want to call it, it right. doesn't matter. It fills us that feel, it, it manifests and, and brings animation to the physical. The reason we come back to the earth, he said, according to all this research he did, is to take everything from our right brain, everything from this eternal, this thing that's connected to eternity that we've kind of forgotten and manifest it on the earth plane. He said, that's the sole reason human beings come back. We're here to manifest on the earth plane. It's heavy, it's sticky, you know, it's kind of like, uh, but he said, the lessons we learn on earth, we use this thing that animates us, that keeps going, theoretically, we mm-hmm. can use all the information we gather and all the experiences we gather on Earth in all the other dimensions that we'll be traveling on. The Hindus say you go through a billion lifetimes and then just start all over again, right? So it's a really big, long game. Yeah. But the point is, if you want to really, if your rational mind wants to get at your life, I say finish your life, complete your life, really get at it. Well, how do you do that, Trey? The only way to do that is you have to bring in all that lives in your right brain, all that lives in your limbic system. He says there hasn't been an act in human history that wasn't driven by an emotion. Life is an emotion first. It's a thought second. Our thoughts were created by our emotions while a kid. A a belief is just a thought tray that you've had over and over and over again. Suddenly it's a belief. Well, how do you uncalcify that belief? How do you at least look at that belief? You have to drift back down into your heart, open that up, and feel into your life. And what's going to happen is the more you do that, you're going to have memories of childhood. You're going to have memories of your grandfather. You're going to have memories. You're like, oh, those are just old memories. No, right. every memory, every emotion stores information. And we are here to bring the information from our right brain, from our belly, from our heart, and put it into the world. That's called creating. Yeah. But we have to figure out who we are in that creation space and what we're filled with in order to create. How, does, how do I figure out what to do with my life if I haven't figured out how I feel about what I do? And all that information and intelligence stored in the heart and belly, I'm trying to put out into the outer world. Yeah. I, I love that. Um, I, I guess the, the first question that comes to mind is where do you, I mean, where do you start with that? I I, I want to get into. I, I, That's I, a leading question, right? I, it is a leading question. Right with it, but no, go ahead. I, 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 I do want to ask a follow up to your, your next answer and talk about uh, psychedelics like DMT, even psilocybin, and how that can potentially either hinder or become a. a I guess, help you get to that point. But uh, drugs aside, how do you start to tap into that part of your brain? Yep. So, you know, all the kind of scientists out there and, and hard left brainers, um, you know, and, and I, I'm, I kind of straddle both sides. Think of the word spirituality. Right. The word comes from Latin. It means to breathe. That's it. It means to breathe. And so, you know, you're like, hold on, spirituality, I mean, that's all we need to do. So when we do some deep breaths, what happens is the body slows down. It activates the solar plexus. We do a couple, if we did three or four breaths right now, breathe into the belly, inhale, exhale, 
what would happen is your solar plexus would start sending signals, biomagnetic signals, up to your rational self, up to your pineal gland, up to your pituitary gland, and it would automatically get the body starting to relax. Yeah. So you ask the greatest question in the world, how do we begin? All we have to do is relax the left brain. The left brain's got to come out of beta. So right now our brains are at beta. Our cells in our brain are working at between 12 and 18 cycles a second. Alpha is the next level down. When you're dreaming, when you're playing golf, when you're reading poetry, whatever that might be, your brain slows down and goes to alpha. The ionosphere that surrounds the earth is at alpha. The tree right now, it's vibrating, right? It's electrons, yeah. it's conscious. You know, the squirrel, conscious, electrons, it's vibrating at alpha. So it's not new agey, that's science. The way to do it is to breathe, slow down, slow down the rational, and what's gonna happen is stuff's gonna come up. Let it come up. That's where you begin. Sit quietly for 10 minutes, deep breathe, and allow whatever's happening in your body, brain, just allow it, allow it to come up. People are like, Bill, I don't understand, allow, what do you mean? Just, if you're having thoughts about work, think about it. Just yeah. don't try to do anything, let the heart open as the rational slows down. It's kind of like the gatekeeper, which we go back to the reticular activating system, right? Your neocortex is, is stopping those emotions from coming up. Just put the gatekeeper to sleep for 10 minutes. That's where you begin. Yeah. I think that's scary for a lot of people. I, I think... <laughs> Trust me, I've been married for 24 <laughs> years and I hope my wife's listening. She's like, don't tell me about meditation again. But you know, the experience that she's had when I literally like, sweetheart, please just sit. She has yeah. these... Okay, you're right. And I'm not I'm not trying to be right here, of course. Right. Marriage is, everybody knows if you're married 24 years, it's not about being right, it's just about being present. Um, it's really scary for people. I tried to get my parents to do it. I mean, I've, I've been at it for 25 years. Like I said, 25 freaking years. Um, it's really hard. But yeah. based on all the ancient cultures, all the ancient ceremonies, it's all based on the exact same thing. And, what, and the science behind it and the health benefits, Trey, of sitting quietly are so out of the ballpark we don't have to enumerate them right now, but and yeah. we could follow up. But the health benefits alone, forget about anything else. The health benefits of sitting quietly for 10 or 15 minutes every single day will blow you away. Absolutely. You know, to me, I, I, I don't know the history of anxiety. It could go back 100,000 years for all I know. But to me, it, it seems to have come, uh, it seems to have become quite buzzy in the last five or 10 years, which... Yep whatever but to me it seems like the suppression of these feelings of these thoughts of uncomfortable what uh, ideas is what causes that anxiety at least for me and, and not allowing ourselves to just reflect on them say hey this thought isn't so so bad just just let it be you know it's amazing on the weekends and, and uh weekday nights i'm a therapist i've been a counselor for 14 years, which yeah. just means I'm more, I'm more screwed up than anybody, but I'm, I'm much more aware of it 25 years later. What you do, so if, if we were to do, you know, you, and you do this on your own, what you do is you start with a thought, right? Say a thought of, I'm anxious, you know, I don't have enough money, right? What's the feeling behind it? Yeah. Less than, right? What you do, the way home is you follow, you take the thought and you follow it to the feeling, then you follow that feeling to the part of your body, and then you focus on that part of your body and you allow the feeling to come up. Yeah. You allow it. And what's what happens, all you're doing, stress is the gap between your desire world and your belief world. Yeah. Your belief world stored in the neocortex, your desire world stored in your heart and belly. That stress, the gap, depression, whatever it is, anxiety, is the gap between what you want and what you think you can get. And so look, you just have to start with a feeling body because it's telling you what it wants. The rational mind's like, yeah, I know you want that. I know you want the boyfriend, I know you want the million dollars, but I can't get it. So now there's this massive gap and you just start to close the gap through that initial process of introducing each other feelings and thoughts. Yeah. I, I, I like that example. Um, because on, on your, on your website, uh, the, uh, whole counseling, um, yes, sir. Website, .com, .com. Uh, uh, you ask how, how serious are you about working on your relationship? Mm. And one of, <laughs> one of the first questions is, you know, try sitting alone to see if, if you're ready. And I, I, I'm finally comfortable in my own skin after 35 years. And I, I've probably been so for a couple years now, but I can think back into my twenties when I so desperately 
wanted to be with somebody because I didn't want to be alone. And that was the reason why it wasn't, it wasn't for the sex, which was, you know, obviously a yeah. great benefit. It wasn't for, it was it, helpful. Yeah. It is helpful. <laughs> it wasn't necessarily, you know, walking down the street with, you know, somebody holding my hand. It was because I didn't want to be alone. And so I was not able yeah. to answer that question. Honestly, like, I, how important mm. is that when, when somebody is just so stressed out about wanting to have a life partner, but it's only, they're not doing it for the right reasons. So great question. Golly gee, I'm serious. Like these are, uh, these are big, big questions. Um, I think the, we have such a desire, let's say, using a partner and not yeah. being alone. The right. desire is I don't want to be alone. So what happens is in our body, this kind of um, constriction of like, I am alone. I don't want to be alone. So there, so kind of like, it's almost like the universe is hearing like alone, alone. What we have to learn to do, and I'm, this is some powerful work, and and, and they've been the, the kind of the industry, the, the self help and counseling industry has been doing this inner child work for about thirty years now. Yeah. Imagine if you're in that place in your twenties or thirties, right, and you don't want to be alone. If you can go back and connect with your fourth grade self, your eighth grade self, your twelfth grade self, what happens is, as a human being, we can't there's only one thing in the world that we can control one thing and that's how we feel yeah. and so i am alone and i don't want to be alone is this powerful feeling well how do i i need to start filling that with myself before i go out to the world with this big need because the bigger the need it's almost like the more repellent it becomes right it's like a magnet it's so strong and and you know those people like you, you meet them and stuff and you can just tell gosh they're really they're really wanting of this thing and you're like oh kind of it almost repels you a little bit and so how do we do that go inside and fill that desire to not be alone with more of yourself reconnect with your grandfather go i can't tell you how powerful it is trey when i relax people we could do it you know anytime it's so simple it's one minute or two minutes relaxation let's go back to fourth grade yeah. and bring your fourth grader in and suddenly you notice like you get a little bit of a tear and you're reconnecting with that younger part of yourself because your fourth grade self trey knows everything yeah knows about animals knows the planet knows like He's, he's much closer to the non-physical, right? He's only, you know, eight years out or nine years out. Meanwhile, us 35-year-olds and 40-year-olds and 50-year-olds, our left brain have calcified, if you will. <laughs> and so we forgot about the magic. We forget about the, 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 the really special divine nature of, and I, I shouldn't use that word too much, but like the beauty of nature and all yeah. the simple things, that's our core self. So fill our adult self with a little bit of our childhood, childhood self makes a bit, can, can have a powerful shift. God, I love that. Does that make sense? <laughs> it makes perfect. I can't tell you. I'll tell you, the last two weeks, I've done seven sessions with three different counseling clients, clients that I've actually gotten from being on this Relationship Advice podcast. Yeah. I did one, and, and, and every single one, we go back to fourth grade or eighth grade and 12th grade, and the insights and the feelings of just not being alone and realizing, oh, my gosh, what's your fourth grade like? What's your fourth grader think of you? What's your eighth grader think of you? And I know it sounds crazy. Our rational mind's like, well, the fourth grader's long dead. No, the desires of the fourth grader live today. Absolutely. He is still alive. My fourth grade self, I could go back to him in an instant, riding my bike with my dog, Sam. And that was this beautiful, special world. And I tear up just thinking about it, Trey. That's how powerful our childhood desires are. Yeah. We've left them behind. Well, let me let me exemplify your point because I, I can do so very vividly. I um. So I live in Columbus, as I mentioned, Columbus, Ohio. I, yep. I was born here. And then when I was 10, my dad got a job up in, in Northeast Ohio. So I moved up there. I, I, went to, I went to Kent State University, which is up there. Then I moved back down to Columbus about well, 11 years ago. And so now I'm in a part of town that's not, that's not far from where my mom grew up, not mm. far from where I grew up. And I've started... I'm, I'm a big runner. I, I've, I've started adding distance to my runs, so I'll run uh, 10, Love 15 it. miles. And so I have run by my mom's old house. Mm. I have run by a park that my grandpa, I used to call him Pop, would take me to fly a kite when I was, I don't know, six or seven years old. And and it's not something that I, I remembered vividly, but as I run by these places and I just think back about the on, on the history of them, yes, it gives me that feeling. It brings that tear to my eye. I know exactly yeah. what you're talking about. And it feels Beautiful. so freaking good. So good. And so so what we do with that, it's like, so, so our, ra our rational mind's thinking, so what? All right, so what? Well, if we can tap into the energy 
the disposition, the desire space, which was much cleaner when we were in fourth, fifth, seventh. Like we hadn't had, you know, you know, mishaps in our life or whatever. So the energy was really clean. It was like this desire to be an astronaut. Well, I can't be an astronaut now. Right. Okay. I'm not saying be an astronaut, but the desire, when you reconnect with that fourth grade self or that eighth grade self, that desire piece is the one that you need to infuse your rational brain with. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. imagine spending half an hour with him, <laughs> that fourth grade self. Like you'd, I, I promise you, you'll feel a vibrational shift. And that's all we're doing. We're not trying to fool the rational brain. Right. We're just trying to get the body to feel whole. And how do we feel whole? We collect, we collect those parts of ourselves. I'll, I'll give you this for instance. And the ancient cultures have been doing this for a long time, right? So, so John Bradshaw wrote the seminal book called Homecoming, you know, um, Reclaiming Your Inner Child, Game Changing. If you read one book in your entire life, read that book. Just read the first 15 pages. Yeah. I've sent it to probably 30 people over the last 25 years. And so for us Westerners, I was like, wow, what a notion. And I, I prided myself, for better or for worse, on doing as many modalities to see which ones, if there's a coherence, if some modalities, you know, kind of stand the test of time. Well, I went to a Native American shaman about 11 years ago. Yeah. Be why? Because I just wanted to see what's his tactic for self-awareness. What's his tactic to growth? I got goosebumps all over me right now. He sits me down in this kind of ramshackle home. It's in the hills of Connecticut. And the first thing he says to me is, we're going back to when you were a kid. Yeah. And that was it. I'm like, so now we have this ancient culture that's been around for, I don't know, 60, 70,000 years. The legacy, the, the, the medicine is go back to the child because that's your original self and bring him in. Bring her in, right? And I know for us rational brain thinkers out there, it's kind of like, ah, it just doesn't make sense. But I'm telling you, it's going to create a shift. And in that shift, that's all we're trying to do is we're trying to open. We're trying to push. How do you finish your life? You push the emotions out. And then behind that is new stuff, a new job, a new opportunity. And I always say to people, once you start tapping into your inner self, what would you love to do? Oh, I'd like to dance. Go take a dance class. Guess what? You're going to meet somebody. Yes. Oh, I love to draw. Take a drawing class. When I first started meditating, for some reason, I wanted to learn the flute. Well, I took flute lessons, met this really cute girl. We just dated for a little bit. The point is the universe is waiting for us to tap into our true emotional self. Yeah. And it's, a, it's not easy. No. Right? Because it's like it doesn't pay the bills. Taking a flute lesson wasn't yeah. going to pay the bills. Right. And we do have to find the joy in the adult rationalizing world that we are confined to and have to finish and do every day. But we got to give ourselves a break. That's what religion was based on. That's what spirituality is always based on. It was celebrating play. Be playful. And that's where the growth can happen. Yeah. I I wanna so I wanna I'm trying to figure out how to ask this. So yes, I I, I give yourself the chance by, by taking a class. I for for me it was it was uh, signing up for a, a rock climbing uh, gym, and that's Love become it. such a big part of my life. But, and I also I, I mentioned this previously. One of the biggest hurdles or the barriers to me finding, I, I'll, I'll call it this, finding myself through through a spiritual awakening was was my drinking. I, I I've said this a mm. thousand times. I've, I was never an alcoholic, but drinking was holding me back from the things that I wanted to do and the things that I wanted to spend money on. You know, whether it's rock climbing or mountain biking or, or whatever, it was a hindrance to me. So. How much of what you mentioned mm -hmm. is removing, not just, you know, taking the leap and doing, taking the class or, or whatever, but removing any toxicity or hindrances, hindrances front that are holding you back from actually from, from doing those things. Such a great call. Such a great call. So there's, 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 I look at whatever we're doing to slow down the rational brain, drink, smoke, sex, run, whatever we're trying to do, we're, we're, we're trying to slow down. We're trying to get an outside thing to slow down our ration. Like, why do we drink, right? We want to drink because we relax, right? right? That's all. Like, right. And so drinking can be super innoc innocuous. It can just be this kind of fun little gathering. But for some folks, because the rational mind is so charged up, drinking is like the elixir. It's like the only thing that relaxes them. Yeah. So it's really our intention with whatever we're doing, whether it's marijuana or you talked about you know, the psychedelics, the psychotropics, all that stuff. It's our intention. Are we trying to slow down our rational mind because we can't figure another way to do it? Or are we using it to enhance the immersion, the, the arising up of our emotional self? You'd be surprised. Like 
Some people are happy drunk. Some people are sad drunks. Well, it's whatever they are emotionally yeah. that the rational mind is kept it in. Yeah. They drink and then the true self comes out. So if it's an elixir to bring your true self out, have at it. Here's the challenge. If the rational mind is sleepy in a sleepy state, stone, drunk, whatever, it can't get the lessons and the information from the emotional self. It doesn't have the clarity because what we, we need the rational mind to help sort out the emotions, just like the emotion world, our emotional world needs our rational mind to take all this stuff and put it out into the outer world. Yeah. We need the rational mind to put self into the world. So if they're dialoguing, but the left brain's asleep from drugs or you know otherwise, you don't get the information as clearly. And so um, I always say, as long as you can remember the stuff that comes up in you, it doesn't matter what you're doing. Yeah. Right. Because the ancients have been using potions, you know, grasses, weeds, all, like the ancients have used them very constructively, very productively. Right. So we know for humans and I'm not trying to I'm not advertising anything here. I know for humans it's natural. The problem is we, we cornered ourselves in this Western world of like got to solve stuff, got to do stuff, try to, you know, totally overloading our rational mind. And a lot of times, especially in suburbia, the only way people know how to relax is go drink or yeah. go smoke or do something. <laughs> Um, so that I celebrate just being aware of what the intention is and, uh, and are you gathering the information that you need from your heart and your belly and your reptilian mind, your yeah. reptilian brain. Yeah. So I, I do, I do want to touch on that. We're talking about psychotropics. Um, what are your, what are your thoughts? And I, I want, I do want to add, uh, All in. You, you talk, I love it. I love it. That's Here's fantastic. What Here's what I'll tell you just real quickly. Stanislav Grof, um, Holotropic breathwork. Stanislav, Stanislav Grof, G-R-O-F, was um, in Switzerland. He was part of that movement in the 60s and 70s when the drug companies, Roach, I can't remember the names of them, were using LSD to yeah. deal with um, psychiatric problems, right? Yeah. What he realized by the 70s was that through deep breathing, you could get to the same place. And so he... I th I think he's still alive. I've done, I did about four or five sessions. These are deep breathing, three hour sessions where you're lying down, you're breathing deeply. And he's done thousands of them around the globe, written a great book, Beyond the Brain. Um, the point is, is that whatever, I love the idea of psychotropics, absolutely love it. Use it to learn and grow. Right. Also, when you lie down at night, breathe deeply for five minutes and go visit your grandmother who's been passed for 10 years. It's all the same thing. It's yeah. all taking you to the same spot. And so, you know, people like they've solved the riddle of life by holotropic and microdosing, whatever it's been around for 300,000 years. Right. So I'm all in, I'm a, I'm a, I'm very inclusive. My wife says I'm a little too inclusive, but <laughs> I'm like, Hey, if it's working, bring it, but understand why you're doing it. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I appreciate that sentiment because I, you, you think about mushrooms, people will do those recreationally. And I, I yeah. you know, when, in, in, in regard to uh, psychedelics, I have not dabbled. I would like to dabble, but I have not dabbled. But when it comes to things like DMT or ayahuasca, mm -hmm. those are things that to me, it seems you do because you want to have an experience that is going to yep. broaden your universe. And I, so... I mean, not condoning drug use here, but yep. I mean, if we talk Understood. about, you know, how to best accomplish that, yep. I mean, we're, we're, here's, you, here's, you mean, here's yeah, what you're ahead. really saying, and I love it. What you're really saying is how do I get to the dream body? Yes. How do I get every night we dream, whether you know it or not, whether you remember or not, I dream every night, like just like everybody else. And so what we're saying is here I am in my midday, you know, on a Tuesday, how do I get to my dream body? Well, it's harder to do it without probably a little bit of help. So that's where the microdosing, all that stuff can be super. That's what we're trying to access our non-physical self. Right. That is it. You can, you can coin it. You can term it any other way. We're trying to get at our heart, yeah. which is storing emotions and memory. That's it. And so, you know, have at it therapy. Like my, for people to slow themselves down, Whatever you do for exercise for 20 minutes, 30 minutes to get your heart going, to get some sweat going, do that and then find a chair or a piece of ground and sit down with your spine straight. Yeah. That's the homework. 20, 30 minutes, go for your run, go for a swim, whatever you do, play golf. It's got to be motion because you want the blood to be circulating. Why? Because you want to oxygenate your system. You want to put oxygen in by doing something rigorous and it's just really good for you. 
and then it creates the endorphins. What do endorphins do? Relaxes the left brain. Bingo. Now you sit for 10 minutes with your back straight and just listen to your heart, listen to your belly, and just listen. Yeah. People are like, Bill, what am I listening for? It doesn't like listen. And guarantee you, guarantee you're gonna have a memory from fifth grade, you know, your grandmother, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. Allow it up. And now you're in dialogue with what? Your dream body. Yes. Your non physical self with your right brain. That's the dialogue which we've got to introduce to our left brain. I love that. I love that. And so I'm, I'm hoping this is kind of a natural segue here, but I mean, we're talking about some of your current work, you're working on something called the Intuition Project, correct? Yes. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Talk yep. to me Thank more about for, that. You know, really all it is, Trey, is, um, you know, after 20 plus years of, of research and really the reason why I went back to get a master's in social work was because I really wanted to understand the science because I, you know, we used to, I used to call it like I'm in I'm I'm kind of like Missouri, prove it. I think it's Missouri. Like I I from the Northeast, born in New Jersey, lived up there for so many years, and there's this kind of healthy skepticism around there about spirituality and yeah. physical and all that stuff. And I realized, man, I just got to go back and and really do the research and 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 look at it. The Intuition Project, all it is, is kind of codifying or putting into a 12 week class where day one you are learning and practicing the art of exactly what I've been talking about, slowing down, relaxing. And then, you know, it's basically going to be a college level course that anybody can take. We're going to get it accredited. And all we're doing is I could say, Hey, meditation is good, but here's the context. I want people to be doing the physical work, understanding themselves, and then having the historical context. It's really called the history of being human. Yeah. And so human beings have been doing this for 250,000 years. And there's a ton of great programs out there and there's a ton of great therapists and they're all doing, I'm just trying to put it into one frame because as Yogananda says, which is the greatest book ever written, Autobiography of Yogi says, the only way you access your fullest life is from the physical space in between your left and right brain and that's called intuition. You're, you, when, when you meditate tonight, because I know you're going to do it. I am. You didn't promise me, but I'm, I'm leading the jury here. You're going to sit for 10 or 15 or 20 minutes and in that space, you're going to have some kind of notion. You're going to feel something like, wow. And it's either going to be the truth or not the truth. And the truth is just simply what, like a truth is an experience. Yeah. It's not a thought like, um, you know, sun warms the earth. Okay. That's a truth. You can feel into it. That's a simple, but like you can feel into it. That feeling awareness is called intuition. It's the space that is in between your left and right brain. And it's not driven by our five sensory perceptions. You have, we have to get behind our our sensory perceptions and get into that heart space. And in that place, in the middle is intuition. Yeah. I'm good enough. I, I like, for me, parts of my intuition, when I really started meditating, I realized I understood the feeling. I understood the world of my grandparents who were long dead, but I understood what they were going through. I understood how they got to where they were. I understood their, 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 their disposition and response to the world. And my, and people are like, well, how can you do that? I'm like, cause I could feel into it. Yeah. And our parents passed down biomagnetically their lives and their parents passed it down to them. So we're really just at the end of this long stream of biomagnetic, bioelectrical energy. And every thought is emanating, every feeling is emanating out of your heart, right? So your parents emanated their feeling bodies into your heart. You soaked them up. And now what you're doing is trying to make sense of what's in there. And the only way is in this intuitive space when you're quiet. Yeah. And, and unfortunately, the only way to get to intuition, and maybe somebody can call me out, is through sitting really quietly and just yeah. listening and waiting and waiting, and something's going to come up. That was I, a long diatribe. I apologize. No, 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 I no. I, so I like problem. it. It's 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 got me thinking about a lot, and I want to see if I can put some of this into words. And so, to me, I I don't know. I've never really thought about what intuition is. It's just it's something that you know, but. To me, mm. when you said, you know, you're, you're good enough, that was kind of a, a realization to me that intuition, it seems, is predicated upon experience, whether or not that is something that we go out and, and, and do, whether it's running or taking classes or whatever. It seems like it, it's predicated upon experience. You, you ha you, you're able to intuit when something is going to happen because it's something that you, you've, you've done before. And so knowing yeah. that you're able to sit with yourself and intuit uh, whether or not you're, you're good enough or just something you feel like is going to happen. That just, it, it, that is, that is to me, a perfect example of feeling fulfilled, feeling like yes. you've, you've been through the ringer in life and you, you know, this, 
beyond a shadow of a doubt because you're good enough at this point in time. Beautiful. I love it. So two things as you're talking. If you were to walk into your bedroom or your classroom when you were in third grade or second grade and you asked your third grader, are you good enough? Your third grade would be like, well, what do you mean? Like, right. Are you like, do you feel in the world? Yeah, mom and dad are cool or whatever. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. feel good enough. Right. And so what's changed? The outer world has bombarded us and our karma has has kind of introduced us to all the things that we're not. Yeah. Right. Because it's really easy. Our left brain, our left brain is dividing good or not good, bad or not. But that child, the first eight years of a human being's life are pure limbic. They're pure right brain. So is the is my fourth grader good enough? Well, if he's on his bike riding his, with my dog, he's totally yeah, good absolutely. enough. Absolutely. Right. And so intuition is tapping in to the ancient feeling body of the child that is that was infused by the parents, infused by their parents, blah, blah, blah. And so you're just trying to get back to that space. Here's another thing that Joseph Campbell talked a lot about. It's intuition, you said experience. It's a powerful word, right? So I'm 56. Right. I've had a lot of experiences. But when I started sitting, I started intuiting experiences that I hadn't had in this lifetime yeah. that had been passed down to me through my limbic, biomagnetic, heart, belly system because right. our heart's an antenna. It's soaking in our parents' world. And so I was having insights that you would think, well, how would you have that insight? You're only in your 30s and 40s. I'm not saying like I, I solved any math equations, right? but my intuition taught me what it's like to be human. And what happened is I understood my own suffering, my own sadness. I, I can tear up just talking about, I didn't have a sad life. I had a great life, but right. I inherited from my relatives this kind of morose little bit of sadness. And so that was preventing me from being whole in my life because I had inherited the sadness and I didn't understand it. And when I started catharting it and letting it up, it all changed. I realized that every human being goes through the exact same things, just different versions. Yes. And so I was just like everybody else. <laughs> that the guy that cut me off, he's angry because he's sad that he lost his grandmother. Yeah. You know, the, the, the wife that's, that's you know, dismissing you and being a jerk, she's doing that because she's feeling somehow less than because of her inner experience, and she's just throwing it out at you, and you have no control of it. Yeah. So intuition is this powerful place of, and um, uh, Jane, Jane Roberts says this in her book, Seth Speaks, powerful book written in the 70s. She says, a truth has a biomagnetic resonance to it, that when you get to a truth tray, you actually have a shift. Yeah. There actually is a scientific electron shift when you're like, oh, everybody's the same. Everybody, like, you just, it, 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 and what happens is that's happening in your belly and your heart, and it sends a signal up to your rational brain, and your rational brain's like, good call, you're right, and yeah. you have a shift. Like, the rational brain gets the information to this intuitive location, which is heart, belly, and, and midbrain, and it goes, you're right, everybody's the same. Yeah. And so then the rational starts acting differently because of what's been infused and come up from the intuitive place. Yes. Yes. Uh, that, that makes perfect sense. And I, I, this may be a horrible example, but to me, when we talk about intuiting experiences that we have not had in this lifetime, let's say you've got, you've had a perfectly normal and healthy childhood growing up, and yet you become this masterful artist who paints these sad and morose images, mm. but it, it, it comes to you from a feeling that you, you, you have trouble understanding. So to me, that, that's, that's, that's bringing those two pieces together. And I, I may be completely Bingo. off base about that. No, but, you nailed okay. it. You nailed it. You know, um, if, if you, if you kind of didn't believe in prior lifetimes, you look at someone like Mozart and all these great, great right. um, savants who by the time they're three, four, or five, you're like, okay, that they didn't learn that from the parents that came in with them. That's the beauty. So let's go back to what you said half an hour ago. People are scared of this inner world. They're scared of sitting. Why, Trey? You just solved it. They're scared because, oh my gosh, I've got stuff in here, not only from this life, but I've got my parents' sense of self. I've got yeah. my parents' Here's a great example, and I use it all the time, and you know, my mom chuckles. I watched my mom, amazing. My parents are still alive. They're the most incredible two people on the planet, 89 and 86. But my mom browbeat my dad over the years. Yeah. She browbeat him, yeah, you know, whatever. Every, every, every life is 50-50. He should have stepped up more. The point is, I soaked in that witnessing the browbeating, and I soaked it in my limbic body, didn't know it. So when I came out into the world in the 20s and 30s, I was kind of angry at women. And I'm like, 
once I started sitting like, hold on, Bill, why are you angry at women? <laughs> no woman's ever dissed you. They're trying to get right. more information from you. They're trying to have a good date. And I realized that I had witnessed that and soaked it. It wasn't good or bad. I just realized, oh, okay, that was their world. I've got my world. And it just opened everything up. I understood the feminine more, understood myself, understood the little boy in me who was sad or lonely, whatever. And it was just this huge cathartic realization like, oh, okay, I soaked in that. I found it in my intuition. And that's their world. And I'm in this world and I'm pretty okay. Yeah. I mean, nothing's been that simple. I, I spend a lot of time in tears. I mean, full candor. You know, I've done almost 8,500 hours of meditation the last 25 years, and I would say probably 70% of the time there's a tear that comes up. Yeah. Where's it from? I don't know. It doesn't matter. It's the body processing it. And there's nothing better than a good 10-minute tear, and I feel like I've, like, just jogged two miles and, like, and, and drank a coffee. The energy that comes from behind the cathartic and opening up the sadness yes. electrons in the body is so powerful. It, it is, that is an elixir. Touching your sadness and longing brings the greatest joy. I believe you never get the greatest joy and the fully complete your life until you unearth all the longing and sadness and you bring it up and you're like, wow, because the joy is that much bigger. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you know? I, 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 I couldn't agree more. And I, I, I guess this is a good place to kind of start to, to bring this to a close here. But when we talk sure. about happiness and there's so many... Mm. When when I tell somebody when I tell somebody in the street that I, I've got a podcast on happiness because that's just the easiest way to talk about the podcast <laughs> the podcast yeah. on happiness, it, you know a lot of times the the thought is I guess the mentality behind happiness is that you can't have happiness without you know without sadness without without dark without or light without dark and so on and so forth and yep. I, I think to a certain extent that what you just said kind of you know brings that full circle I mean we we can understand the value of, of where happiness comes from if we understand what we worked through to get to that point I I'm probably yeah. articulating this poorly but no, it, it just it makes perfect sense to me through what you just said that you know, understanding the, 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 the dark times in our lives, you know, the, the shit that we had to go through just allows us to appreciate happiness, joy, contentment, all of those, not necessarily synonyms, but those things that bring good feelings yep. about that much more. You nailed it. You nailed it. And so we live in a plane of existence called earth, which is based on what opposites, right? The right. reason why the earth exists is because it's based on opposites. So people say, are you happy? I'll say, I'll, when I'm doing this, I'm crazy happy. Yeah. When I'm doing this, I'm not that happy. When I'm with these people, I'm super happy. Happiness isn't a steady state. Right. It, it's like you look at the tree, look at the squirrel, right? The tree's doing its tree thing. When it's in a storm, it's probably not that happy. I, I'm being a little facetious, but right. the point is, is if we can be more like nature, realizing that the vicissitudes, this, the good and the bad, the green and the blue, whatever, the opposites have to exist. The problem is our culture, we get a big dose of sadness, and then you're like, I've got to go get happiness, right? So we do drugs and we whatever we, you know, whatever we do, we spring to the happiness space, leaving the sadness space behind. Well, we haven't left it behind. We've just avoided it. Right. And so intuition projects, sitting, talks like this, Trey, like it's all about just exactly what you said. It's the balance of find the things in your life that you enjoy, do them when you can. You know you got the drudgery and the regular kind of rationalizing world that we have to live in as an adult, and it's going to swing. Are you going to be happy for eight hours a day at work? No. Maybe two hours. Right. Work on them one hour. Whatever it is, just know that you have the ability to understand the balance of some days I'm happy, some days I'm sad. Now, for some people, that's that's a very kind of um, glib, like right. some people are really sad, and that's right. kind of you know, uh, you know, you know, depression, and that—that's that—that's a different story. We'd have to we have to really plow into that. And a lot of people are going through that, especially from COVID. Yeah. But the point is, is that if we address the inner world, we will see where we're stuck on the deepest kind of longings and sadness. And as long as we can bring them up, we're going to have glimmers of something on the other side of that. But you're right; you have to have this longing in order to feel this kind of sense of, of fullness. Yeah. And connectivity, you know. Absolutely. You know, I want to, I, I want to say this to you because I feel like you have the knowledge to be able to break this down for me. For the longest time, for, seriously, since in all of my adult life up until a couple of years ago, I would feel like when something good happens to me, that I'd have to be afraid mm. of the other shoe dropping. And I've realized <laughs> recently 
that I think that we were trained by Hollywood to feel that way. Because if you think about the first two acts in a movie, things are going all honky dory. Yep. And then the, the third, going into the third act, it's the dark night before the storm, whatever it's called, yep. you know, shit yep. happens. And so we are trained to feel by cinema when something is going our way in life, that something bad is naturally going to follow it. And I just, I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? It's so powerful. It's it, it, that, I mean, I was, you know, raised by like a lot of my um, mid fifties, 56 raised by depression era parents. That was the notion. That was the paradigm of, you know, don't, you know, don't celebrate too much because just around the corner is another third, you know, whatever, right. war, whatever that was just based. That was just their disposition. That was their biomagnetic disposition to life. It's hard, Trey. It's really, really hard because you're right. When we, when we get lifted by the glee of life, something really good happens naturally we're going to come to the other side of that right yin yang i mean yin yang means dark side of the mountain light side of the mountain right. so we're going to rise and we're going to fall it's knowing that we can address the fall through our understanding of self and celebrate the happiness in its fullest knowing it's not i shouldn't say it's not fully sustainable the glee and the emotion of the happiness will there will be another side to it because you are going to have those points where you know things aren't as but you just got to celebrate it Right. Celebrate it, let it go. Celebrate it, let it go. We're not what we do, we're who we are on the inside, right? So you have a big success at work and you're thinking, oh God, this is only going to be downhill from here. Well, just, we have to learn. And this is me talking to me 25 years into this kind of self help craziness I've been in. Yeah. Just celebrating points in my life and not worrying about tomorrow. I think AA is such a powerful model. Yeah. Because they say, you can't solve tomorrow. Work on today. Yeah. Work on today, work on today, work on Bill today. Be in Bill's world today. Will it be joyful? Yeah. Will it be sad? Yeah. But just if I can stay in today, the power of now, greatest, probably top five book ever written, Eckhart Tolle. Yeah. Read it. If you, I mean, I'm just saying out there, yeah. it's about being present. It's the hardest thing on the planet to do is to be present right now. You and I are just present in our moment. Who knows what happens when we hang up? But we're in this moment here and it's a powerful place and it's connected to eternity. But I don't have the answers because I'm the same way. I was raised by depressionary uh, parents, and I'm always like, uh-oh, I'm peering around the corner for something tragic, right? I'm like tragic, tragedy-seeking. Yeah. I'm being facetious, but... No, yeah. no, uh, no, that that makes perfect sense, and I, I really appreciate you, you clarifying that for me. I... Um... God, I, I know we could talk for another hour. Uh, and I, I, I <laughs> have more questions for you, so maybe we'll schedule yep. another time to do this. But, uh, yep. Bill, I, I can't express to you how much this 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 time has meant to me. I, I really appreciate everything that you're doing and you for holding that this space for me today. Thank you, Trey. Yeah, I appreciate that. It's it's uh, I can kind of feel the emotion coming up because I can feel the appreciation, and it's a beautiful thing. It's a really beautiful thing. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, before before I close, I warned you. I've got a, a few yep. few questions. <laughs> I want to yeah. I want to throw your way. Um, you know, I, I I am more than gracious for people spending their time with me. I, I keep getting to have these really enlightening conversations, and it's literally changing my life. I mean, I, I can't mm. overstate that. Um, and so I always like to be a resource to my guests as, as much as I possibly can. And so one of the most natural questions to ask to ask is, you know, if somebody happens to be listening wherever, uh, in California, Ohio, Connecticut, whatever, and they feel like they could be a resource to you, what resources are you looking for to continue growing in what you're working on? That's such a great question. Thank you so much. The two things that jump out at me are, number one, I just love these conversations, right? And, and you know, if anybody's out there and they just want to have a conversation, no charge or anything, just talk for 15 or 20 minutes because just connecting like that, yeah. us humans, We've been doing that for eons since the beginning of time, but the way our culture is set up now is suburbia and cities and people live in their own homes. Like people aren't connecting. So number one, connecting. And number two, you know, we're, we're, we're building this educational platform. Um, and so anybody that out there that's kind of versed in, you know, taking, taking these notions and coursing them up, so to speak, um, that would always be super helpful. But I think the most important thing, and thanks again for asking is yeah. let's connect and, and, you know, like just think of the connection this connection stirred an emotion of joy and longing in me yeah. that like i have that that's a piece of eternity right there if we can do that together all of us more of it we will change we will change the earth Absolutely. so just connecting good good well i i usually ask this at the end but i mean what is the best way for people to connect with you um wholecounseling.com 
cool. Um, is my website. Um, I did. Uh, I finished a book last. Came after. I don't know, about 12 years, finally. As an English major, it's kind of sad to say it took me 12 years, but came out in October of last year. It's called Waking Up Marriage, Finding Truth in Your Partnership. It's not about marriage. The book's about pretty much everything we talked about. It's just using our every relationship we have, our boss, our spouse, our girlfriend, our mother, whatever. Someone else is kicking up our own stuff. Yeah. My, my wife's going to kick up more of Bill, more of that little boy in me. And so we just use, as I say, stand in the fire, finding truth of yourself in any partnership you're in. That's really what the book's about. Um, and then wholecounseling.com, you can find me, find like Whole Foods, but wholecounseling.com. Awesome. I, I will put uh, all of those links in the show notes so people can find those easily. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely. Um, next question, you've already answered it, but the, oh, maybe you can delve into it a little bit more, but uh, your life-changing <sighs> book. So I've got the nine books literally next to my <laughs> desk. Um, so... Autobiography of a Yogi. I'm going to give you the. I'm going to just go with that one. So okay. Steve Jobs passed away. Yeah. Um, he had one book next to his bed, and he read it every year. Guess what it was? Autobiography, Autobiography of a Yogi. Yogi. Yeah. Okay. Powerful. Why? Because if you read that book and get through it, you're going to be like, "Oh my God, I can't believe life." Yeah. Here's a, here's the last thing I'll say. Steve Jobs passed away. He had 500 people at his funeral. Jeez. Every person that walked out of that funeral got a, bo a wooden box. You can look it up. I think it was 2015. They got a wooden box. Guess what was inside that wooden box? Autobiography of a Autobiography yogi. Autobiography of a yogi. Yeah, it's so powerful. It's, it's, the, it's the true story account of Yogananda who came to the U.S. in the 20s from India. And part of his mission was to start to open up the hearts and literally send a new vibration into the, you know, to the American system with yoga and stuff. So unbelievable book. Um, you know, Homecoming by John Bradshaw, super powerful. Um, you know, Far Journey or Ultimate Journey by Robert Monroe. These are like, these are big, blocky, yes. unbelievably. Like if you can get, if you can spend the universe story, Brian Swimmy, the universe story, like if you can get into that book and just, so anyway, I think I have them all listed on the website, I but these it. are books that I've read over and over and over again, because each time I read it anew, something anew happens. Yes. Something, something, because I've traveled further down the ocean, down, down my own personal, interpersonal river, right? So yeah. You know, anyway, so that's my, that's my stick. Perfect. I love that. I love all of those. Um, and then yeah. last but not least, I'm, 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 I'm kind of looking forward to your answer here. If you had, <laughs> sorry, not to put uh, you high, too high up on a no. pedestal. Yeah. If you had a personal call to action to leave the audience with, what would that be? So you're saying what my call to action is or to people out there? To, yeah. I, yes. What, what is, what is your call to action to the people out there to, to help yeah. bring yeah. clarity to their lives? Use the emotions and feelings that someone else is kicking up in you. Your teacher, your parents, your grandmother, your wife. Use the feelings. Take them back. The word relationship comes from Latin. Relatus means to carry back. Something's going to get kicked up in you, Trey, when you interact with somebody else. Take that feeling and carry it into your cave. As Carl Jung says, into the cave is where the treasures of self is. Take that feeling. Take it to your cushion. Take it to your therapist and go into that feeling spot. My call to action is don't react. What's happening inside of you, go be with whatever's being kicked up in you, in your silence, in your meditation, in your therapy. Be in that. Your, my call to action is please sit with your feelings. It's going to give you such incredible information. And that's where your intuition is going to kick up and call me later. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I, Bill, thank you so incredibly much. Oh, that, that, that I've got chills now. So thank you for, thank you for that. Um, just thank you for everything. If, if people want, thank again, you. if people want to contact you, they can do through, do so through your website, yep. which is wholecounseling.com. Absolutely. Awesome. Bill, let's do you this again, please. Man, thank you. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you. Right, take care. Bye-bye. One more time. I would like to extend a huge thank you to Bill for joining me on the podcast and for providing me with new ways to think about the world as I journey through it. If you would like to learn more about Bill's work, please be sure to check out his website, wholecounseling.com. And there are extensive notes in the show notes section at themosaiclifepodcast.com. If you're curious about any of the books or topics we discussed, you can find all of those listed there. 
And hopefully it goes without saying, this podcast would be nothing without you. Thank you so incredibly much for taking time out of your busy days to listen and to continue demanding the best for yourselves. If you would like to connect with me, you can follow me on Instagram at Trey Kaufman. You can search for the podcast on Facebook, The Mosaic Life Podcast. And of course, you can find all of the show notes at themosaiclifepodcast.com. And you can even sign up for the Circle newsletter, where you'll get email reminders about brand new episodes and content once or twice a week. Thank you all again. And until next time, take care, do better, and be well.